Canon is about to announce the R1 and R5 Mark II, and I'm really excited. I'm all set, ready to watch this live announcement. I got my morning coffee. It, it's actually not coffee. It's it's salt water. It's a great way to start the day. It's a little bit early right now, so I still have to be quiet because everyone else in my house is asleep. And by everyone else, I mean my wife and dog. So let's check out what Canon has to say on the R1 and R5 Mark II. And hopefully they left some specifications up for surprise things that haven't been floating around in the rumors. And when it's over, we'll check back in. We'll see if I'm gonna be buying this. We'll talk about who these cameras are really good for and some of the features that I'm most excited about. See you soon. Well, I'm excited and disappointed at the same time. I think the R5 Mark II is amazing. And I'm honestly a little disappointed by the R1. I think it's a great camera and it has some great features, but I was expecting a little bit more out of it. And after looking at the specs of these two cameras side by side, it almost seems like unless you need some of the very small features that the R1 has that the R5 Mark II doesn't have, the R5 Mark II almost seems like the better camera. And before I dive too much into these cameras, I just wanna say in my opinion, it really seems that Canon is really focused on the video aspect with these cameras. I understand so many more people nowadays are shooting video and need video, and it almost seems that it's easier to make improvements on the video end of things because cameras in the photo department have come so far that the upgrades to the photo features of the camera seem almost insignificant compared to what they're doing on the video end. First, let's talk about the fact that these two cameras share a ton of features. There's very few things that are different between these two cameras. Some of the most exciting features that these cameras share, I'm gonna say right off the bat, is the fact that you can shoot photo and video at the same time. Now, from the little bit of information that I've gathered so far, it seems like you could only do this while shooting full HD. I wish you could do it in 4K, but it's still cool that you're able to shoot still images while shooting video. I think that's a really useful feature for hybrid shooters. Now, both of these cameras offer some in-camera computing technology where it gives you the ability to upscale an image directly in camera and also apply noise reduction, which is pretty cool. I'm interested to see how this does in camera versus doing it in computer software. Being that it is in camera, I'm sure that there are some proprietary algorithms going on there, which is nice, opposed to doing it in a computer where it has to play nice with all cameras and manufacturers. So we'll see if there's any difference between doing it in camera and doing it in a computer. From some of these sample shots, the upscaling and the noise reduction looks pretty good, but listen, they're not gonna show you anything bad at the time of announcement. So we'll see when people get their hands on production models. And with both of these cameras, Canon seems to be really pushing the fact that they can do pre-recording. And personally, as a wedding photographer, I don't really see myself ever using this. Maybe I'll just play around with it here and there, but for the most part, I don't think I'm gonna want this. I have a feeling it's gonna kill the batteries faster, and I just don't really find it to be that useful. Being a wedding photographer for so long, I kinda know the moments that are about to happen, and my camera's already up, and I'm ready to go. So I don't think I'm gonna use this feature, but time will tell, and we'll see what it's like when I get my hands on it. And what's really nice about both of these cameras boasting stack sensors is that the rolling shutter is supposedly significantly reduced. From what I've seen so far, that does seem to be the case, and I think I'm going to really like this one, especially when I'm shooting sports. Both of these cameras now shoot 4K 120 with audio. Love that, absolutely love that. There are times that that is very important to have. There's been multiple occasions where I've been shooting at 120 on my R5 Mark I and really wish I just had some audio so I don't have to fake it all in post. Just having that real audio that's happening while recording. And we're also getting 240 at 2K. Really like that for some nice slow-mo options. I can definitely see myself using that while shooting vertical format videos for social media. We're gonna have to find out. And to top off all these awesome video features that both these cameras are getting, you also have the ability to upload your own LUTs directly into the camera. So you're no longer stuck at just looking at Canon's Rec. 709 interpolation of your log footage. You can upload any LUT that you want to the camera, which is really cool. 
A very small feature that Canon added that I know is in other Canon cameras, but just not the R5 and R6, is that when you're recording, you have a red box around the screen indicating that you're recording. So many other camera manufacturers do that, and I just think it's a really nice feature because just having that little red dot in the corner of the screen that says record, sometimes just isn't enough. And it's also cool that they put a tally lamp on both of these cameras to let your talent know that, hey, we're rolling. Or when I'm doing this, talking to the camera stuff, I know that I am recording. I, I do have a monitor that I look at as well, but it's just nice having a little light saying, hey man, we're, we're rolling. They both have the new IAF, and I'm really excited to get my hands on this camera so I could try that out and see how it works. That's where the focus point will go wherever you're looking, and it tracks your eye. I think that's really cool. I'm excited for that one. Their new autofocus system, they call it dual pixel intelligent AF. And I know people love throwing around the word AI, but they didn't here, which is nice because I don't know how much it is AI versus it is technology. But there are some features in here that are pretty cool. It can track the subject with a brief interruption. You can also register people's faces in the camera to track. I think this feature was available in the R3, but now we're getting it in the R5 II and the R1. I absolutely love that. As a wedding photographer, in the beginning of the day, I'm gonna wow my brides by saying, hey, I gotta take a quick picture of your face straight on, just because I'm gonna register your face into my camera and tell my camera to only focus on you for the rest of the day. It's gonna make them feel like a rock star. They're gonna think that I'm cool because I have this crazy technology built into my camera. I can see that being a, a wow factor at weddings. Also with this new autofocus system, apparently it's going to take in information about the subject and their body position, their limbs, their eyes, their faces, as well as other people around them, and use that information to track what's going on when it comes to sports. As of right now, it looks like there's only three sports registered into the camera, volleyball, soccer, or football, if you're outside of the United States, and basketball. I really hope that they add in some other sports. I get why they did these three sports. They're typically a little bit slower moving of a ball. They are a little bit more predictable, but hopefully through firmware updates, we see Canon add in other sports. I would really like to see baseball, American football, and tennis would be nice additions just to start. And what Canon's saying is that this autofocus system is better than the R3. So it puts the R3 in a weird position for why would anybody want to buy it now over the R5 Mark II or the R1, especially with where it's positioned in price. And speaking of price, let's talk about price. The R5 Mark II comes in at $4,299, so $4,300 if you live in the United States. It's a little bit more expensive than we were expecting. I was hoping it would be right at that $4,000 mark, but you know, inflation stuff. Shit's expensive. And the R1 comes in at $6,299, which is pretty much on par for the one series of cameras, right around that $6,000 mark. As far as the R5 Mark II goes, we're getting that 45 megapixel backside illuminated stack sensor, which has been thrown around in the rumors for months now, and I'm so excited that it is actually true because that is the one feature I was most excited for when it came to this camera. Faster readout speeds, faster autofocus, and just an overall better performance with the camera, and I am going to very much so welcome that addition that alone was enough for me to upgrade from the R5 one to the R5 two. And this new sensor can shoot up to 30 raw files per second in electronic shutter. I like it. I don't think I'm really gonna use that too much as a wedding photographer, but it's nice to have that option. The R5 Mark II comes with a new battery. Now it is a higher capacity, but apparently it's the same shape and size as the old LPE6 batteries but it's a newer version of it. So the camera does require a little bit more power and it is apparently backwards compatible. So you can use this battery on older cameras and then you can use your old batteries still on this new camera. It is a nice new feature knowing that we have a stronger battery to help power the extra battery consumption that this probably processor is requiring. We are also getting 8K and 4K RAW, but there's a really cool feature that it's also bringing, is you can shoot 8K RAW internally to your CF Express card, but you can also shoot 2K MP4 to your SD card. I could really see this come in handy for wedding videographers who are doing a same day edit, so you have that high quality file for the final video, but you're able to take that smaller, more compressed file that's easier to work with and just hand it off to your same day editor and let them go do their work so they can have that same day edit ready for the couple before the wedding's over. We're finally getting a full size HDMI out. Yes, I know the people in the video world have been asking for this for a very long time, and like I said, 
I think these new cameras, they're a little bit more focused on video features and specs than they are the photo side of it. And this full-size HDMI port definitely shows that Canon was listening to its users. Speaking of which, they are also including waveforms during recording. This is a feature that you see on the cinema cameras and you haven't seen on any of the mirrorless bodies before. They now give you the option to monitor your waveforms while you're recording in camera. You're also able to get false color and zebra patterns while you're recording. I love that I no longer need an external monitor to see these features while recording. And it's the little things that matter, right? They took that little switch from the R6 Mark II that allows you to very quickly switch between photo and video, and they put it on this camera. Whoa, love that. Big thumbs up for that one. Thanks, Kevin. And you also have the option of putting three different battery grips on this camera, which is very interesting. I don't think we've ever seen the option for three different battery grips at the time of launch. One battery grip is just gonna be your traditional extended battery grip that allows you to put two batteries in and extend the battery life of your camera. The next one is going to be a cooling fan option, which they're claiming increases record time. I am seeing claims of up to 120 minutes. We'll see when the cameras actually come out and people get their hands on it, how long these record times actually are. But we're claiming two hours, I think that's pretty good. I don't know too many people roll on a camera for longer than two hours. And then they have a third grip that is just for a dedicated ethernet out if you're somebody who's shooting sports or photojournalism and you have to get your images out and onto the internet as quickly as possible, they have a nice little battery grip that includes the ethernet port. Something that we've seen in the one series cameras but never available for the five series cameras, at least at the time of launch. Now for the R1. There's really not a lot of differences between it and the R5 Mark II. It has a 24 megapixel backside illuminated stack sensor so it's similar technology at a smaller megapixel count, which in theory should give us better high ISO capabilities, but we'll see when we get some sample images and, and people start testing these cameras out. The R1 does shoot 40 frames per second, opposed to the R5 II, which only does 30. So that's gonna really come in handy for those sports shooters and photojournalists. And with that 24 megapixel sensor, you're able to shoot 6K raw at 60 frames per second which is very nice. And the R1 uses dual CF Express Type B cards, which are a little bit more expensive than the SD cards. So if money's an issue, you probably shouldn't be buying that camera in the first place, but that's just something to factor in. And that's really all we got for the differences between the two cameras. There's not a whole lot of differences. Now, who are these cameras for? The R1 is obviously geared towards sports photographers, photojournalists, wildlife photographers, people that are shooting fast moving subjects and need to shoot at really high frame rates. But what about the R5 Mark II? Basically everyone else. If you are somebody who cares more about video, I would probably lean towards the R5 Mark II. And then if you are shooting anything but what I mentioned before, the R5 Mark II is a great camera. And for some sports photographers, photojournalists, or wildlife photographers, they might even lean towards the R5 Mark II just because of the larger sensor, the ability to shoot higher quality video, and the smaller price tag. Now, if you're between the R5 Mark II and the R5 Mark I, do I think that the R5 Mark I is still a good option? Absolutely, I'm keeping mine. I'm still gonna use it as my second camera, and you're able to find the R5 Mark I now for less than $3,000. It, right now, the time of me recording this, it's very easily accessible for $28.99, and I'm sure that the market is gonna be flooded with used ones very shortly. So unless you're looking at the R5 II and see some of these features that you think are going to make a large impact on your ability to make a good picture, I'd say go for the R5 I, go for the EOS R, go for the R6 II. There's a lot of really good options in that full frame lineup of mirrorless cameras that Canon has that you don't need to be spending over $4,000 on the latest and greatest just because of one or two other features. If money's not an option, go for it, get the R5 II. Go for the R1 if you think that it's really gonna make a difference. But in my opinion, as a predominantly wedding photographer, the R5 II is a great option for anybody looking for the latest and greatest while still creating a beautiful image. Let me know your thoughts and opinions on this. Drop a comment below. Tell me if you think that you're gonna be picking one up. Are you excited about this new camera? Are you disappointed? Are you gonna hold off, maybe buy the R5 I or an R6 II at a little bit cheaper of a price tag? Or do you see yourself taking some of these new features and really implementing into your workflow? I'm excited to talk to all of you in the comments below. Even the people who think that this camera is a huge disappointment, tell me why, I wanna know your opinions. And until I get my hands on this camera, I'm done talking about it. But when I do get my hands on it, be prepared for some very extensive testing. And if there's anything specific that you want me to test out about the R5 II, comparing it to the R5 I, my opinions on it as being a wedding photographer, 
drop some comments below so when I do get my hands on it, I can start making those videos for you guys. And until next time, peace.